before her son had exercised the option as trustee to sell the apartment to finance her living. Okay? Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, because before the settlement, and, and we were told, I, uh, before the settlement was signed, we were told by our attorneys that my wife's son had all the authority to sell this apartment as the trustee just to care for his mother's needs. And the only way she was able to stay in her home is if we signed the settlement and gave Celeste and I this first option to at least refinance the apartment. So we, re, we, we signed it thinking we were gaining this sense of security, this provision, this protection of refinancing first, taking away her son's first right to sell the apartment. We were, but it turned out when we went to get the refinancing, we discovered that all these limited partnerships that her son had, had taken control over made it almost impossible for a lender upon their lending laws to finance the apartment because there were too many uh, variables. Most lenders, most banks don't want to lend money to an entity that has multiple owners, limited partnerships, and it was there was because of the lawsuit there was some question as to who had what control of these limited partnerships even in the face of the of the refi even in the face of the settlement there was question as to who had control of the limited partnerships and i and that was not known to Celeste and I. that was never disclosed to Celeste and I when we signed the settlement that there was any question as to who had the control we thought according to her lawyers telling us that her son had all the control so i asked her when we were having trouble getting the refinancing i asked the lawyers what do you mean there's a problem with the with the limited partnerships and that's when they revealed that the these lenders had problems with it and so I found a lender, personally, I, I, a neighbor who was willing to co-sign on a loan and bring in an, a, a private lender who would finance the loan. And when the private lender asked to see the same documents that all the other lenders were asking for, that's when Celeste and I were made privy to the information that apparently the lawyers had since discovered and didn't tell us, which was my stepson could not produce the document that proved that Celeste ever transferred to him the 1% general partnership share, the controlling share of the company that controlled the apartment. Okay? Our lawyers should have discovered that before we signed a settlement. And if her son could not produce all the transfers, the documents showing all the legitimate transfers to himself, that created the ambiguity that the lenders couldn't deal with. So when this was disclosed to Celeste and I that he couldn't, that he couldn't produce this one, this document showing that he didn't have that he had the one percent that Celeste didn't, this one percent control. I said I started questioning all the lawyers and the validity of the settlement saying, is it a fraudulent settlement? And they said no, because in the settlement, you were willing to give him the 1%, it says. The way we wrote it is that he has the 1%, and you were willing to acknowledge that he has the 1%. And I said to them, and I took the position on behalf of Celeste, that we only thought he had the 1% because you said he had the 1%. You were the lawyers. We never saw these papers. And, 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 and the, the lack of proof, or the proof thereof, and that he had the 1%. So I started questioning the validity of the settlement. And then her son started to insist that his mother should sign the 1% over to him now and backdate it eight years to 2002. And at this point, I, I thought we would be out of our minds to give him control that we fought for seven years to try to get Celeste to keep. And if she always had it all along, why didn't we use this as part of our defense and as part of the lawsuit? And it turns out, quite frankly, Scott, that had Celeste known that she had this 1%, her lawyers could have advised us to go to the co-op get them to return all the shares to Celeste of her apartment, and it would have been, been taken out of the trust. It would have been securely in her possession, and the trust would be just with the, 
money, but not the home that we're depending on staying over our heads. And that was a scary proposition because now the trust includes the money and the, the, the apartment, and there's this ambiguity about who's in control of what. And since her son couldn't produce the 1% transfer, that we, we were not able to get this loan from this private lender. And when the loan fell through, the co-op had not been paid their maintenance fee for six months. And they then had no recourse but to insist on moving towards foreclosure. And that happened six months ago, or five months ago. And as a result of that happening, I went to the kids through the lawyers and said, would you be willing to give your mother $51,000 of the $200,000 that they owe the estate. That's part of the settlement. Out of the $500,000 plus that the sons took as, as, as loans and called gifts, as part of the settlement, they're responsible for, spending, for paying back to the estate $200,000. But they don't have to pay it back until they inherit it. So it doesn't even have to come out of their pocket. And I basically went and asked if they would pay back $51,000 of that now so that we could pay off the co-op. And, and in response to that, the kids said, we will only do that if three things are provided. One, Mr. Basile is responsible for, spending, for paying for all of our legal fees in excess of $800,000. Two, that the remainder of the $200,000 that they own they owe the estate is forgiven completely. And three, that we sign a letter of agreement, Celeste and I, that we're willing to sell the house and move out immediately. So they wouldn't even help her ward off a foreclosure for the purpose of staying in her home indefinitely. Why would her children do this in, in general? This, this constant yeah. battle that's been going on. This is their mother. Why would they do this? Your answer to that is as good as mine. I'm going to tell you, and your guess is as good as mine, because Celeste is an amazing, caring, compassionate, loving, wise woman. She is not, you know, she worked hard her life and enjoyed the, the, a successful career, but so have so many other parents and have good relationship with their children and and the children didn't hold it against their father or their mother that they were working parents. And I know that Celeste is, 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 is caring and compassionate, and she's not a malicious woman. There's nothing about her that is vindictive or petty. So where this hatred comes from is beyond me. Uh, and, and I can tell you this, her son, who's 72 or 73 years old, as part of the settlement, you know, one of the things they said in the New York Times was that they haven't been allowed to visit their mother. That's just an outright bold-faced lie, okay? Because as one of the terms of the settlement, they were, get, they were granted 18 visits a year with their mother. And that grandson who made that comment and his father haven't even requested one visit in a year and a half. And they haven't requested or seen their mother or called her or even written her a letter or a card in the, in the nine years that this lawsuit's been going on. So that was just a bold-faced face lie. Now, the oldest son, who's now 73, he has taken advantage of those 18 visits and requested three or four visits and been granted a visit every time he's requested it. And just two weeks ago, he came to this house to, sit, to visit with his mother. And in the course of that visit, he reminded her that, this is a quote, you ruined our lives. He used that visit to tell her that she ruined their lives, and he raised his voice, got angry at her, and forced her to apologize at least four or five times over the course of the visit, and he reminded her, and this is what's really funny, he, uh, ridiculous I think, he decided he wanted to, sh to spend the time by reading his book that he recently wrote. And he told his mother, now I just want to tell you that you're not in this book. And do you know why you're not in this book? No, I'm saying it just like he said it. Do you know why you're not in this book? 
And she's like, no. He said, because there was a lawsuit going on. And I, I, I and the lawsuit had would would made no difference as to whether he sh- couldn't put her in the book. It, but the thing is, is in the book, if he had put, if he had put her in the book, he would have had to present. He would have presented the truth of his real feelings. Okay. And now, when he was talking to her in person, he was reminding her as he was reading the book. He would stop and interject into the into the conversation with her how she failed him as a child. One of the things he was reading to her in the book was about how he went to this particular school. And then he stopped and told his mother, now if I went to that school because you wanted me to go to that school, but I hated it. And I'm surprised I didn't grow up to be a juvenile delinquent because of that choice you made. Now this is how he treated her just two weeks ago in a, in a, in a meeting that he was allowed to have that, I, that we thought were supposed to be friendly meetings. But had he put that in the book, it would have contradicted the image they tried to present to the courts, because they tried to present to the courts that they were close to their mother, to, close to her, and loving and respectful. And he even said and reminded his mother two weeks ago, "Now you know because of this, when you threw me out of the house, I could have sued you." He said that to her. But I, you know, I just basically said to hell with you and didn't talk to you for twenty-four years. This is how. He spoke to her just two weeks ago. And she's 94 and doesn't remember any of this stuff, Scott. And he's using his visits to remind her of how he thinks she ruined his life. And I, I, when I, and I wasn't in the room, by the way. i got to tell you, as part, of those, as part of the conditions of those 18 visits, is I'm not allowed to be there as her husband. So we had an advocate sitting in to protect her. And when he started to raise his voice, they had to step in and say, excuse me, stop. You're upsetting her, and that's just not reasonable. She's, she's, you know, she was not feeling well. And when they, after the meeting lasted about two and a half, almost two, uh, an hour and a half, almost two hours, and when Celeste had to go to the bathroom, they came in and they told me what was going on. And I did go into the other room, and I said to him, this meeting is over. You will not come into this home and abuse my wife and make her feel guilty for your emotional problems. You need to get professional help. You need to get help, and you need to leave here right now if you're using these meetings as a, as a, as a punching bag to your mother. Frank, when anybody hears this story, it's obviously now easy to understand it, why the, the kids have a problem with Celeste. And, and why is it? Under, when, I want to ask you the question. Why is it easy to understand they have a problem with well, I, I, okay, maybe I phrased that wrong. Not easy to understand, but if they feel she wasn't there, they might feel some resentment. Certainly not uh, uh, necessary to do what they've done, but I think that this is maybe why they're angry. Scott, can I tell you something? Sure. She had. She. They never want. They never once needed to worry about having a house, a, a home over their head bills paid, what school they were really going to go to, if they could afford to go to a good school. She she was there as much as humanly possible. She included them in her careers. They vacationed together. Even as an adult, she spent money to send their kids to school, college, grad, grad school, post, you know, to, to college and then graduate school. She financed, they were using her like a bank. When I showed up, I realized that we discovered that's what was going on. And her son, when I finally asked him, why did you take your mother's control? He said, because I didn't trust you. I said, but under what conditions? He said, well, you started asking questions. And, by, and, and when you started asking questions, you started spoiling the well. And that's a quote from him. I said, what do you mean, spoil the well? He says, she was willing to pay for things that, you, that she finally stopped paying for. That was one of the reasons they had a problem with me. Because I started talking to her, getting her involved in her own affairs. And she started going to her son and, 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 and taking action and, and, and participating. And uh, because what happened, quite frankly, is she, when they wanted to borrow money from her, they were borrowing it at a discount that she was already earning in, in, in the investments, and they weren't letting her. It wasn't a win-win situation. They were completely taking advantage of her, and 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 and, st- and taking her money. And it turns out that this kind of behavior, they had tried to do it earlier when she was married to Wesley Addy for 35 years, but Wesley put a stop to it. And after Wesley died, 
they started running carte blanche through her money and started using her like a revolving bank. Well, and and they and they were they were concerned that you know if I did start to ask enough questions it would end. And he literally said, "You spoiled the well." And you know I, these kids have always felt somewhat entitled that if they can't have her physically there, they were going to have her money. But she is when she's there. There's one thing about Celeste when she's with you, she's really with you. She's not off somewhere else. She's emotionally, she's involved, and she's giving, and she's compassionate, and she, they never needed to want, and I can't imagine them having also not been emotionally cared for by her when she's there. Frank, I think the other question that people are going to ask, and, and we haven't talked about it, but they're going to say, this could have stirred um, emotions in the children when a... 40-something-year-old man marries an 80- and 90-something-year-old woman. Well, first of all, I, I didn't marry a 90-year-old woman. I did marry an 85-year-old woman. 85-year-old woman. Yeah, but, but we had also met much earlier. It wasn't like uh, I just jumped in here and said, would you marry me? And we met three months earlier. We had been together for four and a half years by the time we married. Okay? I, I would say that... Out of respect to the dynamics that you're about to ask about. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I guess what I, the only question I would have, and for the listeners out there, would be that is not an atypical marriage age range. How did that happen? It happened like any other marriage, Scott. We love each other. Period. And, and not only do we love each other... But it, 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 but we love each other through some of the most difficult periods of time in life. And it happened like any other relationship. We met under, under honorable circumstances. We had a mutual friends. We met through what we do as a profession. We, we had a lot in common. And we fell in love. Period. And, and, and the age never was a problem for us. So, that, but, but we did know that the kids, you know, it's natural. Listen, I'm not stupid. None of us are stupid. It's, it's natural to, to question, okay, why? It's because it's non-traditional, the age difference. But that doesn't make it what their fears want them to think it could be. And, and anybody that knows Celeste, she was, when I met her, there was nothing feeble about her. It wasn't like I came in and, you know, there was this woman who was a potential victim of some, you know, uh, Svengali stalker. She was absolutely, in her own mind, strong, capable, and active, and had her, her own control over her own life. And part of the thing that she, she did within that capacity at that time in her life was fall in love with me, and vice versa. And, and yet when that, diminished, when that capacity started to diminish, I was too much in love to, with her to run to the hills. That's when, you, that's when love steps up and shows itself. But these kids ran in and took advantage of her failing condition. And I wasn't, I was, I got to tell you, if I'm, if I'm, I'm angry at myself, quite frankly, Scott, because I was trying to be so sensitive to the family dynamics that I wasn't a bigger pain in the butt to them and a bigger interruption when I, when I could read between the lines and she couldn't. Because I didn't want to invade myself into affair, or impose myself into affairs that I wasn't legally entitled to do so. We were only living together. We were we were in love. We were in a relationship for four years, four and a half, or actually three years when they took the control, four and a half when we got married. But but I wasn't legally in a position to do anything when they were doing all of this ugliness and this 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 subversive behavior. So I was trying to respect that, and they took full advantage of it. And, and, and then what happened, the bottom line is, when they told Celeste and I finally to our faces, this is why we took your control. And if you continue, we're going to have to force you out of your house within two years. When they said those things to us, Scott, my wife, now my wife, said to me, I said, what did you think about that, Celeste? And she said, let's get married. And I said, why do you want it? She goes, because I want to make sure we are protected. And that was very clear to her mind why, why it was important that marriage was an issue here for us. And quite frankly, I wanted to marry her earlier, but this made it very clear. The only way you can protect the one you love 
is to be in a position to protect the one you love. And legally, I couldn't do so without being her husband. And and I married her because I love her. And out of that love, I needed to be able to protect and give to her the kind of relate the life and love that she deserved and protection. And you can't do that playing house. You can only do that being married. So as much as we were willing to 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 just have our love affair and be uh, you know quiet and discreet and not get married in public and not put it in the paper, as much as we were willing to do that, her children forced our hands to step up and say, this is who we are to one another. And if you're going to fight your mother, you're going to be fighting both of us. Frank, I don't think people question your... Well, maybe they do. But I, they do. I, you kidding me? They, they, they do. They do. <laughs> oh, but I guess... Listen, I, can't re- I can't believe... It's, it's, I can't believe some of the, the horrendous accusations that are, in, that are being you know, pinned towards me based on some of the just the things that are written in these papers people it's so easy for people to jump to the worst conclusions because of the lack of traditionalness in our relationship but anybody that understands love knows that the spirit and love has no age well, well based on that let me ask this question which is normally a question i would not ask but when sure, a, when, when a gentleman in his 40s marries a a lady in her 80s is it a typical marriage in the act of consummation <laughs> uh love and, and and things of that nature what kind of marriage is it you know, if you ask that question to anybody above 70, they would laugh in your face. No offense to you. I, oh, I I'm saying that kind of tongue-in-cheek. But the, the thing is, Scott, people aren't dead sexually just because they're older. And that was a revelation to me. <laughs> okay? There you go. Yeah. All right? My wife is a breathing, living, affectionate, loving, passionate, capable human being who's entitled to experience all of life. She just personally had the courage to accept it when it presented itself in me, in her heart. And I wasn't afraid to express what was in my heart to her, regardless of the, the age that she was. You know, it, it, we had a choice when we realized that we were in love with each other. We could deny it and just be friends, or we could embrace it as something that we felt it was, which was beautiful and from God, and go with it. You know, I, I, I and... She didn't know if she had another three years to live when she realized that she was in love with me, and she even said that to me. She said, you know, I don't know how many years I have left, but I probably only have three, and maybe if I could just borrow you for three years. (laughs) And all I could think of is, oh, my God, I hope it's a whole lot longer than that, because I was, you know, hook, line, and sinker. So, but it was about two and a half years into this relationship when she actually started to have the, the first episode of congestive heart failure. And I remember sitting in her hospital room, Scott, all by myself with her falling asleep at 2.30 in the morning. Her kids hadn't come around, hadn't visited. And the doctors had told me earlier that day that this is just the beginning, you know. This is what's going to be. It's a, it's a serious condition, but with the proper medication and monitoring it, she should be able to live a normal life. But this is the beginning of, of a serious condition. And, and it's a change. And I remember sitting in that room saying, with the, 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 the lights were down to nothing. It was just a... The, Little, little bit of light from the machines and, and looking at her peacefully asleep and all I could think to myself was for better for worse for better for worse I'm not going anywhere and 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 we knew this in our heart of hearts how we felt to each other we didn't need to you know to proclaim it to the world we proclaimed it to each other but yes on a practical level she's still a woman my gosh I'm still a man and, and all those functions work and they work but, you know, as time goes on, um, you know, with certain medications or certain side effects and you have to make certain, uh, you know, sacrifices of you can't do certain things. She's tired. She's, she doesn't have the energy. She, you know, there, there's things you, you end up, um, there's things that, that go in and out of a relationship constantly in every marriage. Okay? But marriage isn't about sex. Marriage is about love. And, and, I, I totally and sex is just one aspect of that, one expression of that, and it goes so much deeper than that. But could we? Sure. And did we? Absolutely. Well, did we enjoy it? For crying out loud, every bit of it. You know, she, she, and, and, and everybody has that to look forward to. I want to tell you that. That was a revelation for me, is that you don't lose that. 
So those children that are looking at their parents saying, oh, they're too old to have sex, I can't see them, they need to take a step back and realize someday they're going to be their parent. They're going to be 70 or 80, and in their mind's eye, they're still going to see themselves as 25 and 26. My wife still sees herself as 26 years old. Right. And as long as she can perform as 20, it feel that she is, she's going to try to perform like that. That's what happens with age. I, I accept that. You know what I mean? I, I appreciate your honesty. Now, one thing I, I do want to touch on here, because we said at the top of this, this interview that the New York Times had done something on your relationship with the family and, and Celeste and the whole issue here. There was something in that, that article that I just want to read word for word from the New York Times, published on July 2nd, 2011. And I want to get your feedback on this, because this, I think if people read this, this could give them the impression that something was up. So explain this, just explain this to all of us. Sure. This was, at this time, the couple had been discussing how much money Miss Holm would leave Mr. Basile after her death, initially setting a figure of $200,000. This is a quote that they had quoted to you. She said to me, $200,000 seems like a lot of money. I, uh, this is again your quote, I added up her worth and it was somewhere around $13 million, including the apartment, her investments, and a family farm in New Jersey. Still your quote. Then she said $200,000 wasn't nearly enough. I think from the moment she talked to her son and he got scared as hell. And that's New York Times, July 2nd, 2011. Okay. Um, that's not... That quote fails to put that quote in context of the, what was what was being talked about before, and, and, and at what time frame in our relationship that conversation took place. Um, which, let me ask you, what do you think it implies? What do you? How do you? Why do you say it, it leads to questions? Because she and I are actually talking about her estate and her affairs. I, I think that's one of the reasons, and again, this is not my personal, but I think no. somebody who hears that is going to say, when she said $200,000, it seems like a lot of money, and you actually went and added up her assets and found that it was $13 million, and then she said, well, 200000 might not be enough. Um, I, I don't know. I guess if she had never been faced with $13 million, she would have thought 200000 was enough. That's the way the quote reads. Well, that, in, to some extent, it should read like that because this is about becoming aware of, of the truth and making an informed and educated decision. Okay? Celeste Holm was being manipulated by her son to make decisions in a vacuum. He was, he was leading her to believe certain things that were not truthful and or letting her make decisions based on, and, and, and basically let her make decisions based on false information. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's not right. Okay? When, when, when Celeste and I first started to talk about her estate, we had already been together two and a half years. So it wasn't like I just met her, <laughs> rolled out of bed one morning three months later said, hey, how much money are you worth? That's just ridiculous. I love this woman. And anybody who's married knows that the people you sleep with and are having, making love to every night are the people you confide in. <laughs> I mean, that's not abnormal. No, no. So put it in context. The conversation that you just talked about, Celeste and I actually had, uh, among many of the millions of conversations it seems like we've had, we had lying in bed beside each other late at night after being together for two and a half years or so. And it, and it, and it, and it, and it didn't quite go like that, quite frankly, as he, like I said, he wanted to present it. Here's what happened. Celeste, after two and a half years in our relationship, and it was in the, it, it was her. She actually said to me, "I want to include you in my estate." She brought the subject up, and I said to her, "She said, well, she said I want to include you in my estate. What do you want?" Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a pretty straightforward question that two people who love each other and engage in a relationship would ask. But I told her at the time. I said, that's for your decision. I am not about to put those words 
in your mouth, uh, you know, or give you an idea uh, like that. I, I said, that's your decision, honey. I said, but there is one aspect that I would like to make sure is care, is, 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 is provided. I, and, and I was aware of her son's animosity towards me. And I started seeing him come around more frequently to have a lunch with his mother maybe once every two months, whereas before he wouldn't see her but once every six months, to, you know, maybe twice a year. And so right around this time, he was coming around once every month and a half or so, or two months.